Howard I did say the Ohio State University. <laughs> I was, trust me, I was actually corrected. <laughs> so, so, Stan, I want to leave it up to you. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, you're right, so we are legally required to refer to the Ohio State the, University. The so, I know there's a camera on, so just to be safe, um, we're legal. Uh, so, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I've given this talk, I think, a couple times, and uh, it's always a challenge because some people have heard this, have heard me talk about this research two or three times, and other people haven't heard it at all. So um, it's always uh, interesting. So what I'm going to do tonight, if it's all right, um, so I'm going to kind of flow back and forth between some different things. And so I'd like to start off by talking a little bit about the animal itself, uh, just briefly, um, some interesting things that make it very unique that me I may not know about. Uh, and then we'll kind of uh, move into the research that we're doing. And I won't go into all the details about the research. Uh, I'm going to pick on some uh, things here or there that's kind of seasonal, kind of topical. So right now, uh, this month, and uh, the next few weeks are going to be the most important time of the year for coyotes. It's right now. So this is the most stressful period for them. Uh, this is when their hormones are at their highest, at least certain hormones. Um, and their success for the whole year um, depends on what happens over the next few weeks. So we'll talk about that um, a little bit and how that works. Um, so it was interesting listening to some of you talk. Um, so I heard, I was listening in, you know, with my rabbit ears, and I was hearing a lot of coyote stories um, being told by different people at the tables. And that's actually one of the really interesting things about this animal. Um, Every animal, you know, generates stories, but it seems like coyotes generate more stories than anything else. It used to be out west is where most of the stories would come and kind of get um, kind of immersed in the culture of the people there. But the interesting thing to watch, especially over the last, uh, now we're in this, our 17th year of this study, is that now that they've moved into cities, now it's actually listening to people that have never seen a coyote before, never thought they'd ever be living with them, or actually telling coyote stories, like you guys are doing uh, tonight. So, um, I'm going to tell you a coyote story in just a little bit, if you'll uh, indulge me. First, I just want to spend um, about two minutes on a history lesson, in terms of how coyotes kind of got, uh, I guess, uh, kind of introduced to our culture. That would be, I'm assuming most of you are um, European ancestry, um, not Native American. So this person, if you're familiar with Mark Twain, has had more to do with your view of how coyotes work uh, than any other person. Um, so he was one of the first people to write about coyotes. And uh, even if you've never read his uh, essay on coyotes, if you've never read it, you've been influenced by it. You have been influenced by it. So, um, if you didn't know, Mark Twain, when he was going out to uh, visit his brother, uh, he was headed out west, and he wrote a, a book called Roughing It, and there's a chapter in there about his first introduction to a coyote. He saw his first coyote on a stagecoach on his way out there, and it was somewhere uh, probably in Nebraska is where he saw it, and um, this is, uh, he went on for three pages, basically telling the, I mean, uh, describing coyotes in the worst possible way. So, for example, this is just a little tiny bit, it's a long, slip, sick, and sorry looking skeleton that is a living, breathing allegory once, is always hungry. And that's one of the better things he had to write about. <laughs> um, it turns out, uh, you all recognize that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Jones is the artist uh, that created the Roadrunner cartoons. He used uh, Mark Twain's description 
to uh, create that um, caricature. So, and that's probably had a bigger impact on people in terms of the general public, in terms of how they view Caius than anything else. So even though you didn't know it, if you didn't read them, Mark Twain's probably influenced you in terms of how you think about Caius. Um, of course, Twain was completely wrong about that, but he's such a good writer, and he's so funny that uh, people still um, are influenced by that. So that's a little bit about um, how we get, um, how coyotes have kind of um, infiltrated our, our culture. It was actually Twain that had a huge influence on that. Now I want to tell you a quick coyote story. Uh, and this is going to be a, a contrast to what Twain um, wrote about them. So um, you all recognize that, right? That's fox hunting. So this is in the spirit of McGraw and its mission. Um, it turns out, uh, so I want to talk about fox hunting just a little bit. So it turns out that uh, as coyotes have moved across the east, uh, they have wiped out most of the foxes, and so the fox hunters have had to adapt, and they are no longer fox hunters anymore. They still wear all the clothes, they still do all the tradition, but now they are hunting coyotes, and that's like freaking them out. So it's changing how they hunt. Um, and they've, uh, they see me, uh, they've actually... <coughs> Um, been very uh, happy, I guess, or interested in, in our research here, and uh, kind of adopted me. Um, and so I've given a lot of talks to fox hunting groups around the country because they're fascinated by coyotes. Coyotes are so different than foxes, and it is it has been a challenge for them to adapt to hunting coyotes. And so this uh, this isn't actually it. I'm just pulling that off the internet. But uh, last year. Um, a guy by the name of F. Wilson, Dr. Wilson, down in Georgia, had been pestering me to come on the fox hunt with us, constantly. And he wanted me to give a talk, uh, kind of like what I'm doing for you guys, only there were like 150 or 200 people there. Um, and he said, come down, you have to go on a fox hunt. I said, sure, I, I want to go on a fox hunt. I've never, I've, I've only seen pictures, I don't know exactly how that works, um, so it would be great. Um, and so I went down, and I spent three days with them, I went on a couple fox hunts, and so my first fox hunt, uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, uh, and again, it's a fox hunt, but it's coyotes, I mean, they are after coyotes, and so they have a property down there, it's about 25,000 acres, so it's a large area, uh, and they um, do the full traditional thing, so they get all dressed up, it's mandatory, you are not allowed to hunt if you don't have the full <coughs> official gear, uh, the horses are stunning, uh, the dogs are amazing. So I enjoy the interactions between uh, the dogs and the horses, and then of course just the challenge of chasing a very elusive animal. So uh, I uh, didn't ride, so they wanted me to ride. I, um, I <laughs> was skiing <laughs> the week before, and I cried, uh, and, I, and I broke, I shattered my collarbone. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I shattered my collarbone. It was like broken. It was like broken all over the place. And so I got there. I said, you know, I would love to ride, but my collarbone was like completely busted up. And not a single one of them had any sympathy for me at all. It turns out that's like the number one injury yeah. for for riders is uh, shattered collarbones. I said, that's not getting you off the hook at all. Um, but anyway, so we did this fox hunt, and, and it went on for the day. And, it, and it, there was a bunch of people involved. It's very complicated. I'm not going to go through all of it. There are a lot of dogs, a lot of horses, a lot of riders. And um, let me um, let me see what I have here. Um, so we get to the end of the day. That's uh, that is um, the picture from that place. Um, it's a fairly large hunt, and this is a, a big deal for them. And this is what we have for our first uh, our first hunt. So we had 37 riders, uh, so that means 37 horses most of the time. Although uh, were, that, that number changed during the course of that hunt. There were 38 dogs. Um, they were used radio collars on their dogs so they could uh, keep up with their dogs and not, not lose them. So they were using high tech stuff. Uh, they also used two-way radios so they could communicate with uh, the flight. So they had four flights. The flight is a, just dividing up the riders into different skill sets. So there's the top skill set, and <laughs> the fourth flight is the really bad one. So you can guess where I was. <laughs> um, so then they have 
radius, they had the radius, they had the, and then the traditional horn and the whistle. And so the horn and the whistle allows them to communicate with their dogs, with each other, which is a pretty cool thing. I really enjoyed listening to that. And then in addition to the actual people out there, then around the perimeter, there were 12, a dozen spotters um, arranged in a strategic pattern with uh, uh, SUVs so that they could see whether or not coyotes were trying to get out and they would flush them back in. Coyotes were wild, so this is not can. This is this, this trying to, to corner a, a, a wild coyote. And then Charlie and me, that was me and Charlie bringing up the rear. Charlie's a 78-year-old um, guy that really um, is in charge of everything. So he had the radio. He was uh, kind of telling people where to go. So we did all that, went for hours and hours, plus a couple of coyotes. So a lot of technology, a lot of people, just imagine those dogs using all that scent, uh, the hearing everything, uh, that's supposed to be on the same par as a coyote. Dog, I mean the horses, so that the humans can actually possibly keep up with a coyote. Um, and then of course all the technology. And so this was the scorecard at the end of the day. So you have humans and you have coyotes. Um, so there were, um, the humans got no coyotes. Um, and the coyotes took two people. people. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how that hunt ended. And that was normal. That was typical. So they went through all of this and then they have a big um, catered dinner at the end and everyone gets uh, very um, lubricated. <laughs> Mellow. And so they do all of this and it was, it was fascinating. And then I asked them, I asked, so how often do you do this? And I'm thinking they would do this maybe four or five, five times a year. Oh, yeah. and, right. And they said, so you've done this before. So uh, they average about four times a week. Four times a week. Throughout the year. Every, every week. Uh, they take a little bit, they'll drop it down to twice a week during the holidays. So when I asked them, well, I mean, obviously the, the question is, well, how many coyotes do you Because you didn't, you didn't come close. They flushed two coyotes and that was it. Um, he says, at best, uh, in a good year, we might get eight coyotes. So that's four hunts a week, um, and they might get eight coyotes with all of that. I mean, all of that um, to their advantage. And so, uh, so then when I gave my talk, I pointed that out to him. I said, let me get my numbers right, just so we all agree. You know, I counted correctly. And I said, and you guys didn't get a single coyote. And uh, they said, yeah, it's just, they hadn't thought about it, but yeah, that's a pretty amazing animal. So it's just something to kind of think about. Uh, this guy is not um, near every normal animal dog running around out there. So that's my kind of story. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why why that animal is not caught so easily. Um, now a lot of them are. So this is a typical. Um, around across the U.S. and in uh, North America, so a lot of coyotes get hunted. Uh, Eighty thousand animals uh, coyotes are killed. Um, as far as predator control, then you have about three hundred thousand that are harvested, um, and then you have uh, a lot of them that are unreported kills. So ultimately, we're looking at between five hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand coyotes are killed in the U.S. every year. And yet, or we don't... five fox hunts. Right. So, absolutely. So, um, they're not uh, seeing any kind of impact whatsoever. They're the least protected animal, and they don't need any protection. So, for example, Illinois is typical of any other Midwestern state. Uh, you can hunt them year-round. You can kill as many coyotes as you want. So, they're the least protected wildlife species out there, period. And yet, they thrive. I mean, how many coyotes do you see around here? And, this, and we are their biggest predator. So they are a pretty special animal. Um, so as I mentioned, they, um, let me see, so this is what's happened. So since we started killing coyotes, this was the historic range before the European Americans came, and uh, this is their range afterwards in the current range. So uh, they're unique among the mammalian carnivores in that they've more than doubled their range, and it's done in most decades when we've had the greatest amount of predator control taking place. Wow. So um, they can easily handle anything that we um, um, basically 
approach them with. And so what makes them so special? Well, a lot of us uh, don't think about this, but coyotes became coyotes about a million years ago. And they're uniquely North American, so they're not found in other parts of the world. Um, so they've been on the North American continent for that long. Most of that period doesn't, didn't look like this. Most of that period, especially the Pleistocene, had a completely different kind of mammalian community. So for example, that's Pleistocene carnivores. So that's not that long ago. That's only about 100,000 years ago. Those are all species that were much larger than coyotes. So those are all, and that's a short list of predators that coyotes co-evolved with, that they had to both be a predator as well as um, uh, try to avoid being a prey. So we had giant, this is all North America, so we had huge cats. Um, cats much bigger than the African lions now. We had bears that are much bigger than brown bears that we have now. Even that wolf, so that would be the closest uh, relative to the coyote as it was uh, living here. That's not the wolf that we have now. That's the dire wolf. We didn't have Canis lupus in North America for most of the coyote's existence. They had dire wolves. Dire wolves are the biggest wolves in the history of the world before they went extinct. And for most of the coyote's uh, history, that's what they had to adjust to. A lot of large predators that could kill them. So the combination of having to be a predator and find food, chase food, um, use strategies of constantly changing prey and avoid being killed by them creates the, like the, the, most, the smartest animal out there. And it turns out, it's my prop, this is one of our coyotes, one of our study animals. It turns out that for their size, they have the biggest brain capacity mm -hmm. among the canids. Um, in addition to that, um, there's other things I can talk about. So the canids themselves have, of course, this long snout, much longer than, say, a similar sized bobcat. So the cats have almost no snout whatsoever. Uh, that's important because that snout has things in it that makes it really successful. So within, you probably can't see that, but if you look inside, you see these, these scrolls inside. And those are the turbinates. And so there's chambers in here. And some of the chambers are, uh, their function is to basically uh, control temperature as the air comes in and out. But the other chambers are pure, what we call olfaction, it's just scent. And it turns out that coyotes and dogs in general have tremendous turbinates and tremendous surface area for receptors for molecules. And there's other things that they do. Um, so without going into a lot of details, when a dog or a coyote inhales, the air takes two pathways. So some air goes to the lungs and goes through the, the temperature regulators, but the other uh, source of air actually goes across the other turbinates and allows them to smell. And that's the only function, is simply for them to smell. So the air is doing different things inside that snout. Um, it turns out that, again, uh, dogs they possess up to, or dogs or coyotes, 300 million, you have to have receptors, there's 300 million receptors inside. Um, that's way more than, say, humans. So that means, proportionally speaking, their smell is 40 times greater than ours. So, what does that mean? Uh, so, sorry about this text, this will be the last time you see words up here. It means that their sense of smell overpowers ours by a magnitude of anywhere between 10,000 to 100,000 times better. 10,000 to 100,000 times better. So what does that mean? Uh, if you make an analogy to vision, that means that a dog, that if you can see a third of a mile, a dog could see more than 3,000 miles and see just as well as we can from a third of a mile away. So that's the analogy. Or in terms of uh, taste, um, if we notice that we have a teaspoon of sugar in our coffee, uh, they can notice a teaspoon of sugar in a million gallons of water. Wow. So that's how much of a difference their sense of smell is in ours, and that's huge. So um, the other thing, um, the uh, 
So there's some people in here that can probably give this a lecture better than me. But uh, when they inhale and exhale, the air is taking different pathways as well. So when they inhale, that air is coming in in a very focused way. So that left diagram just shows air coming in uh, in a single um, shunt. But when they exhale, they exhale through that fold that we all know that dogs have. When they exhale, the air is getting diffused and moving outside. Why is that important? It's because when you exhale, you're moving air away from you, and so you can't smell as effectively. But if you move air to the side, then you're able to still <coughs> smell acutely. So these are just some of the small things that being that middle-sized um, carnivore creates. All right, so that's your, your little history lesson. So real quick, I'm just going to flow through a, a few um, new things that have come up recently that I get asked about a lot. So one is, like, what kind of animals do we actually have here? Do we have coyotes or do we have koi wolves? And I get this all the time. It's like my least favorite question. So we're just going to deal with it right now and get over it. Uh, so you may or may not know that we um, contributed to that documentary that was on PBS, Meet the Koi Wolf. It was very well done. It was done by a Canadian uh, film crew. But the fact that they named that, Meet the Koi Wolf, has basically um, indoctrinated that term, Koi Wolf, into the media and into the, the general public. And it's, a, it's unfortunate. Um, so it turns out that when coyotes, um, again, they moved east, when they moved east, they took two pathways, they went to the south, they went above the Great Lakes. When they went above the Great Lakes, there were not very many mates for them, and so they bred with Algonquin wolves. And so the wolves up there are not like your western wolves. The Algonquin wolves are smaller, a little easier, um, there's less separation from them and coyotes, physically, behaviorally, ecologically. So they made it, and so when the coyotes came out on the other end, in the northeast, they came out with a small amount of wolf gene in them, and that's the koi wolf. Um, now, uh, there's been a ton of research done, and the genetic techniques have increased and, and gotten much better to the point now where they can look at the whole genome of the animal. Now that they can look at the whole genome, what they're finding is that essentially all coyotes, east of that dotted line, all coyotes are... Um, They've got a little tiny bit of wolf gene and a tiny bit of dog gene. That's just stuff that they picked up along the way. There's still coyotes, though. But that's what gets lost in uh, the media. So, I'm sorry, um, this is actually a data slide. I try not to do that. But uh, this is, if you just look at this table, um, these are percentages. They, so they took samples from coyotes from those different states. And those are the percentages of how much of those coyotes were coyote, wolf, and dog. And so you can look at Illinois, and basically the average is about 90, the, the coyotes are about 95% coyote, and then the rest is split, now mainly dog, and then tiny, tiny bit of wolf. And so that's what we have here. So very tiny bit. Not enough to really measure any difference. If you want to know about our size, the size of our animals here, um, so this was published a few years ago by Gomper, and so these are weights, and so I apologize, these are in kilograms, but um, they're broken out by region, and so the northeast is the one with the really tall bars, uh, blue would be for males and pink are for females, and so the main thing is that you see the northeastern um, states or provinces are larger or heavier than they are in other places, but the difference is not that great. So if you look at what is, so the averages are those dotted lines. So the Midwest, which is where we are, we're only talking about a difference of about a little over two kilograms, which is about five pounds. So that's five pounds. That's what you're talking about, the difference between animals that have a larger wolf gene composition than ours. So it, you wouldn't be able to see the difference. And we do work, in fact, I won't talk about tonight, but we have done work and are still doing work up in Nova Scotia, and that's, those are the big, the 80 percenters, and uh, I can't tell the difference between them and our Chicago coyotes. Our Chicago coyotes are also big, but they're big because they're healthy. They are big. Um, 
<laughs> in fact, I just put those in. So if you want to see where Chicago is, um, it's right there. And you can see that in the Midwest, our weights are um, pretty healthy. Pretty healthy. <clears throat> and these are what the weights look like in pounds. So um, I, I threw in rural Illinois just for a comparison. So you can see that if you just compare our coyotes to just uh, 100 miles away, our coyotes are heavier than rural coyotes. And that's partly because of the urban lifestyle. Right, exactly. Too much food. Um, too much food. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that's, uh, a little bit about that. So in terms of this research, so we, we started this project in 2000. Uh, that was supposed to be a one-year study. Uh, what we were going to find was that coyotes don't live well in the city, that, the, that basically the only coyotes that were there are transients, and we would be able to show that, and then we would just move on. But we were wrong, and we've been wrong about <laughs> pretty much everything ever since. And so uh, we didn't anticipate that we would even continue for two years or three years. And it was never the plan to go to 17, but things have changed over time. It's a natural experiment that no one can control. So that's been part of the initiative for this, but also um, there's questions that have changed. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the new um, questions in just a little bit. But we live trap the animals, we mark them, we radio collar them. Uh, some of you met Shane, so Shane McKenzie um, is the research associate here that is supervising the, the research um, and makes sure he ensures that the stuff gets done out in the field. So we have very dedicated people that do the radio tracking. Um, we have people that will be out tonight. Um, and so they track these coyotes day and night uh, throughout the year. Um, this is just some pictures of some animals getting processed. So when we catch an animal, we collect everything from it. Uh, we obviously are ethical and humane when we do this, but we feel that if an animal, if we're going to subject an animal to this, it's our obligation to try and get as much information from that animal as possible <coughs> without adding to their discomfort. Uh, it's ear tags. <coughs> we uh, look at their teeth, one of the most important parts of the coyote's body that people don't really think about. Um, it's their teeth. So their teeth, they need them, and over time, especially as they age, they often lose them, and it can be devastating um, toward the end of their life. Uh, just a few pictures of some animals. Um, it's an animal getting a, what we call a GPS collar. So that's a big, clunky collar. It's, it looks heavy, but it's not that heavy. Um, that's, an animal, that's a collar. That, that particular model has a SIM card in it that uh, functions just like your cell phone, so we're able to text that coyote and uh, we can uh, require, we can request it to get located by the satellites so much and then it will text us back and uh, it will uh, download, we can download the data. So, um, so that's satellite tracking, but of course there's the physical tracking as well. We also collect genetic samples and uh, also disease work. So disease is actually what pays the bills here. Um, in addition to trapping the adults when we go into the dens, and so this is the period, in fact, next week probably, um, we're going to be starting going into the dens. And when we go in, we go into a den once, ideally, and uh, we microchip those pups so they're permanently marked with unique numbers. And we collect a little bit of blood so we can genetically test them. So we are the first study uh, it's amazing because cats have been studied forever. For the first study to actually genetically look at them and to see whether or not they're truly monogamous, whether or not their pack structure is actually relatives, and um, does their gene flow move across the landscape. And so, but the main thing is they're the family life. And it's opened up huge windows, and I'll share some of that with you in just a second. Um, so this is just a few pictures. That looks like a very um, classic um, natural picture, right? This is um, what you would normally expect for coyote pens, but if you turn the camera just to the side, <laughs> you can see that it's actually in a developed area. In fact, that particular site, that's, there's not much natural <laughs> space there at all. That's a very tight, little tiny area. Um, and that uh, couple have raised now a few litters at that site. Uh, if you move over to O'Hare, this is just across the railroad tracks from that perimeter of O'Hare. And so there's coyotes that are 
uh, raising litters there. Um, so <laughs> nice big litter, eight pups. So just a few more pictures of our animals. <laughs> So they are pretty adaptable in terms of what they use for, for their dunes. Uh, like I said, we, 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 we marked them. You'll notice some uh, color variations a little bit. That's also kind of an interesting feature here. And we've had a few animals, one animal over in Crabtree in particular, that had a unique dark coloring. And his genes, now we can tell when we see um, a pup, we pretty much know who the least He's not a parent anymore, but his descendants are still producing genes. Um, and we can verify that through our genetics. And uh, uh, real quick, so our uh, one measure that we use uh, to determine whether or not coyotes are, success or are having a successful life out there is their reproductive success. So coyotes will scale their litter size based on um, the food supply as well as other social uh, uh, constraints. And so uh, you can look at the litter size to see whether or not coyotes are growing uh, population wise or not. That is a, a litter of 11 pups that's coming from a single female and a single male. Um, and in, it, indeed, in most years, our litter sizes are quite large, quite large, which is an indication of they're doing very well in the Chicago area. Just another <coughs> picture of another uh, large litter. And uh, again, well, we've genetically tested these, and we know that they're coming from a, a single mother, a single father, even when they show some color variations um, like that. So this brindle pups, for example. Uh, it's a four-week-old pup, so that's when they're pretty easy to handle. And then five weeks, their eyes are beginning to turn, so they're starting to get the characteristic yellow um, look. They're also developing personalities at that stage, and so you can start to see differences in behavior. We'll talk about personalities in just a second. And that's a six-week-old pup, and that's when they're starting to look like a coyote. And you can see that their eyes have, have changed to that nice yellow look. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a long-term study. It's the largest study that's been done on coyotes, um, not just in cities, but anywhere. We uh, passed the 1,000 mark last year, so we've marked, captured and marked over 1,000 coyotes. Uh, we're hoping to pass 11, well, we don't hope, but we'll, we'll pass 1,100 um, here by next month, for sure. And uh, we've marked over 400 pups, and we've only caught two, for the most part, two dogs and two humans. So we're actually probably just as proud of that as anything else. Um, so, we haven't been sued yet. Uh, and, uh, and this is what it looks like. So that's an aerial image of the Chicagoland area, uh, going all the way from downtown out. And here's just a compilation of all of the territories, uh, of all of the coyotes that we've uh, monitored through 2016. And so you have to look at it kind of carefully that we go all the way into downtown Chicago. And this is what it looks like for a single coyote. Um, so this is an alpha animal from over in the Crabtree Forest Preserve, and uh, it, he had one of those nice satellite or GPS collars. So we have a lot of locations here, and the yellow locations are daytime locations, and the red locations are nighttime. And we, we, we do bias it toward night because the coyotes here are more active then. The, a couple things I want you to notice. So first of all, um, you can see that the boundaries of that animal's territory follows roads, right? So you can easily yeah. see where the boundaries are. And you might be inclined to think, well, that's because the, boundary, the roads are difficult for the animals to cross, and so that's why it's not crossing. And you would be wrong. So just like we've been wrong about everything. Uh, so that animal can cross those roads anytime he wants. He can cross them right in the middle of the day. He can cross them... Um, in the middle of uh, the commune. They can do that, but he's not. So coyotes are highly structured. So a lot of people think it's just a random free-for-all going on out there. That's not true. It's highly structured. They're following a lot of rules. This guy is following the rules. So what they've done is they've created, they use the roads to create the boundaries for their territory, and he's defending that space from other coyotes, along with his group. So he's not alone. He has a mate, the mate is also doing the defending, and then they have a bunch of kids of different ages, and they're worthless. 
So they're not helping at all. They're not helping at all. They help with the following and stuff, but they don't do much of the marking along the edges. Those are the adults. And so if we take him, so these are just VHF locations, but that's still him up there. And we add another coyote. Look at that. That's a different alpha animal from a different pack. And if we add another animal. And so that's what they do. They carve up the landscape into these discrete territories. Um, so it's actually very easy for us to identify and delineate their boundaries. Um, and again, that's not physical boundaries. So, so in other words, they can cross those roads. It's social constraints that are keeping them from crossing those. And then if we go out, these are two different panels. So to the left are, is out here. So McGraw is actually, uh, we have a, uh, the east pack would be the light green there to the left, and then Pelodi would be the kind of peachy color there. So those are two packs that live here in McGraw. We also have a west pack. Um, but then we move all the way to the, to the downtown area. So you can see the difference in that what these coyotes are doing out here in the suburbs versus what they're doing downtown. So their territories out here are very small, and within those territories they're using basically all of it, or nearly all of it. When they go downtown, those, they still maintain territories, and we don't know exactly how they do that, because they can't, they can't cover their perimeters the way coyotes normally do. And yet they're still maintaining exclusive areas, but they can't use the interior of their territories the way coyotes normally would. They're having to use um, the, uh, the small little green spaces and the, and the, uh, the railways and other linear features. Mm. So this is what it looks like up close downtown. So again, they're having to use little tiny patches. So that's on the south side, going all the way to um, the lake. And that represents a lot of work. It's actually not easy to trap coyotes downtown. That's what Shane's been focusing on quite a bit. 